going to take a seat for a second. All right, all right. So if you hear my voice, I always mess this up, clap once. If you hear it, clap it twice. And if you hear it again, clap it three times. All right. Um, thank you all. We, we got through it this year. Yes. Yes. I uh, went up to the hotel room and I put on a pair of pumps to celebrate. Um, here, I'll, I'll show you actually, because uh, my colleagues, yes, 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 yes. Oh, too loud. All right, here we go. Thank you. So last year for How We Move Forward, we did a little exercise inspired by theater and also sports and also Korean sayings. So I just want to make sure we start with just really acknowledging um, still the excitement on this final day. So uh, we're going to do the Manse exercise. Can you raise your hand if you remember the Manse exercise? I love, thank you, Teresa, thank you. All right, so here's how it's gonna work. Uh, so during the World Cup and stuff in Korea, people would get very excited, and uh, when the goal would kick in, folks will say, goal, right? Okay, we're not gonna do that. Instead, <laughs> instead we're gonna say, manze, okay? Can I hear everyone say, manze? Manze. Not your mama said. I mean, manze. All right, here we go. Manze. Nice. All right, so we're gonna fill up the space with some of that manze goal energy since we uh, since we did make it through the week. I'm gonna divide it up here. Manze team one, manze team two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Now you're gonna have to bring it because the conference team really brought it this year. All right. So when I call. Manse team one, I would like to hear the manse, the loudest manse you can bear. Okay? And then we're gonna go around. Manse team one. Manse! I think some people are hungry because I'm pretty sure I heard a mandu or something. <laughs> Korean dumplings. All right. Manse team two. I like that little kick you put in there. All right. Manse team three. Manse. Manse team four. Manse. Manse team five. Manse. That was a lot higher. I really felt that. That's wonderful. We started here from this groin area and we just went, Manse. Where are we now? Six, right? Manse team six. Manse! Manse team seven. Manse! Now, the force was very strong in this group. Manse team eight. Manse! Am I butchering this manze exercise? <laughs> I have to be accountable. All right. Um, now, all of the groups, on a count of three, let's hear a manze, okay? One, two, three. Manze! I just felt like I was in this whole stadium, so thank you for that. Um, so what we're going to do here for how we move forward is now just um, here for a couple of minutes each uh, some session report outs because we had one of the strongest at the intersections arcs in the history of TCG. So um, that's what we're going to do. All right. Are we ready? Yes. We're going to hear Manze. Are we ready? Manze. Great. All right. I'm going to pass it over to you, Gus. Um, okay, so to get us started and to kind of just ground us in the space after we summoned all of that energy, um, I'm going to invite uh, Malik Galani from Silk Road Rising to uh, share a reading of the Quran. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me uh, to share um, a reading from the Quran with you. Um, today, as I speak with you, there are 28 anti-Islamic rallies happening in America right now. 28 rallies in cities such as Dallas, Atlanta, New York, Raleigh. There have been 35 mosques that have been attacked this year already. So as a Muslim American, it means so much to me. But TCG has asked me to share my faith with all of you. I'm going to share with you um, Surat al-Fatiha. It means the opening. It's the surah, the Quranic verse that opens the Quran. And we say that the entire meaning of the Islam is in this surah. I will recite it in Arabic, and then I will translate for you. And we are asked to face east when we recite the Quran, so I will face east. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Bil Alameen, Al Rahmanir Rahim, Maliki Yomidin. Iyakan Abudu wa Iyakan Stain. Ehidina Serat al Mustakim. Serat al Ladina al Amta Alehim. Gayril Magdubi Alehim, Waladalin. Amen. And I'm going to pull up the translation for you. In the name of God, the infinitely compassionate and merciful, praise be to God, Lord of all the worlds, the compassionate, the merciful, ruler on the day of reckoning. You alone do we worship, and you alone do we ask for help. Guide us on the straight path, the path of those who have received your grace not the path of those who have brought down wrath, nor of those who wander astray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, compassion, mercy, grace. Thank you. Um, okay, now what we're going to try to do after that um, is to share what we've been doing over the last three days with each other. We came together at the beginning of the conference for how we show up to talk about the work we were going to do, and then we went into a bunch of rooms and we did that work. <laughs> and sometimes it was hard and often it was joyful, and now we get to come back together and share it. So each group is going to have uh, two minutes to share. I'm going to try to time you, um, but I, I also trust that you will feel the rhythm of the two minutes and your reporting out heart, um, and, uh, and then we'll have a closing moment. Um, so we're going to move kind of in a chronological and then alphabetical order. That's, that's what this is. Also, you'll note that the seats are a little less full. Some folks have had to go to do the things that they do in other places. Um, so there may be some sessions where none of the session leaders are here and if you are in that session and you feel like you can come up and share a little bit about your experience so it can be brought into the room, that would be appreciated. But at the very least, we're going to at least name all of the sessions. Okay, is there support for this? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, anti-racist resources for white people. Hey, y'all. I'm Libby Peterson, and I'm the program manager of Art Equity. So thankful to be with you all. Um, I was one of several fierce white folks who co-built and co-facilitated um, a session, well, three sessions, actually. Um, one focused on white fragility, one focused on white supremacy culture, and one focused on allyship and action, unpacking racist dynamics in our field. And um, these were, jam-packed sessions of generosity, deep questions, profound statements. And, uh, and in some spaces, we were on floors against walls in chairs. And um, from that uh, came a lot of energy and a lot of conversations that will continue to happen. 
and we were both um, in spaces of um, predominantly white folks and then also colleagues of color coming in in solidarity and support um, because we never do the work alone. Um, and I have a couple questions that come as an invitation. So um, for the white folks that we didn't see in the space with us, um, from a place of curiosity, compassion, love, and challenge, where were y'all? And question number two, when are you coming? Because we long to be with you. This is necessary work that we reckon together. So come on in, y'all. The water's fine. Come find me if you want to talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and in, in true modeling of racial justice, you were well under two minutes. Thank you for that. That was awesome. Um, okay, so uh, Asian Pacific Islander artists, the nail that sticks out and other tools for building change. I forgot that there was a subtitle. Hi. Um, uh, so one, uh, what we started, we focused our group on was uh, we broke out into groups and kind of put ourselves in scenarios in which we were encountering aspects of whitewashing, yellow face, and things like, oh, your best friends in the Mikado and they didn't know, uh, they, they invited you to opening night and you guys didn't have a conversation before, or um, that an Asian actor who's been offered a Broadway contract to do Miss Saigon, or things like that, where we're like finding ourselves in these situations. So one, these situations, at, at these circumstances, it's already too late to a degree. We've already, um, there, there are decisions that need to be made and thought of before we even get to that situation. So people need to start considering who are in those positions who are making those decisions. But we are still faced with those situations anyways. So we have to come, we are coming up with ideas of how we combat that or how we um, interact with those situations. And they're complex issues. They're not simple. A lot of people had different, different uh, ways that We're tired. We're tired of having to educate. We're tired of having to be the ones to come up with the solutions. Um, it's, it's not a responsibility. When you do something that's harmful and yellow face or whitewashing or anything like that, I don't understand why it's our responsibility, my responsibility, to educate you. If your, school, if your theater is leaking gas into a school, it is not the school's responsibility to educate you on why it's harmful. It is not their responsibility to come up with the solutions to fix what is it harming. So that is a lot of what I came up, uh, or as a group we realized was there needs to be, the, there needs to be accountability from these organizations to realize when you're told you're doing harm, that you need to educate yourself and come up with the solutions. We will work with you, but then compensate us, because it's our time. It is our energy. <laughs> I'm willing to do it, I have the patience. Some people aren't, and if those people aren't, uh, say that they can't, respect that. So, thank you. Next up is Beyond Diversity, Casting and Cultural Appropriation in the American Theater. I know some of those folks left, but I bet someone was here who wants to talk about what happened in that session. Um, for those of you that were in the session, it was a really great, uh, they had a wonderful panel um, talking about some of the complexities of um, casting uh, for diversity in theater, and then we broke out into groups according to kind of an affinity group based on where you're at, whether you're a playwright, whether you are an artistic leader or managing leader. Um, I went to the managing leader group, so I can only speak to that, so if anybody else wants to jump up, please feel free. But uh, we tried to nail down some really tangible points about what we can do right now to help. And so, uh, for instance, what I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, um, we said, what if we make, we need to make 
authentic relationships with the communities that we want to work in. If we want to tell somebody's story, we need to go to that community and talk to those people, work with those people. It isn't just in the casting. We have to put those people in our staff. We have to diversify our leadership. We have to diversify the hierarchy of theater, uh, designers, directors, and such forth. Um, there is a suggestion to put maybe as an idea, what if we offered um, free acting classes uh, to people of color in those communities um, so that uh, we can cultivate new actors because not everybody has access to getting their MFA or anything like that. So that was one of the kind of, some of the ideas that we were putting forth. If anybody else wants to join in, please do. Thank you. Crucial conversations, understanding bias and navigating hard conversations. Anyone there want to talk about that? Otherwise, we'll never know how to navigate. We need to move beyond crucial conversations and have deep conversations about racism and oppression in the American theater. Brevity is the soul of justice. OK. Um, <laughs> decolonizing theater practice. So we're going to decenter our practice and maybe take all of these different mics. And I'm going to kick us off by talking about what we did together. Um, we meditated on where we come from and the land on which we stand. We embodied the complex social concepts of oppression through brilliant, funny short plays. We reflected on theater making practices and the challenges of and specific steps people can do to decolonize their practice. OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we committed ourselves to in the future. Um, we, oh, right, I put this all on Conference 2.0, so all of the documents that we shared, including the text of those short plays, are all up on 2.0 now, so go to the um, Decolonizing Theater Practice session and you can find those documents. Do you all want to talk about the Standing Rock Theater Action Group? Yes, yeah, so um, Standing Rock Theater Action is one of the steps that you can take. Join us, our Facebook group. Um, and uh, Claudia is one of our uh, organizing partners, Ty Defoe and Megan Sambrazakian. Uh, we are getting ourselves together. <laughs> We're already doing many things. There's lots of resources there. There's also really exciting action that's coming very, very soon. So you want to be on the Facebook page so you know what's happening. Decolonize. Thank you. <laughs> oh, um, OK, so El Fuego igniting new play development. You Anyone who organized it here, anyone who was there want to speak to it? Which one is this? I know, I want to hear about it. El Fuego. Um, sorry. Um, I didn't moderate or plan this session, um, but our moderator and planner are not here. So um, we basically talked about a model that the LTC is trying out and sort of succeeding and sort of not. Um, in not only new play development, but actually, as one of our amazing um, attendees pointed out, it's actually artist development and playwright development, uh, um, and, and talking about getting um, playwrights of color and, and specific Latinx playwrights out of the reading cycles. Um, Y'all are really good at giving us development opportunities, and not so good at producing the plays. So, um, yeah, we don't have a choice, so we're going to do it ourselves, and we're going to work with the companies who've already been doing it quite well. Uh, great, so next up is Middle Eastern and Muslim American theater artists, now more than ever. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Evan Ochigan with Golden Thread Productions. And I'm Jamil Corey with Silk Road Rising. And our organizations uh, were the leaders of two sessions that uh, focused on this field. Uh, we, in the actual affinity session, we had about uh, over 30 people um, well, when we are affinity group babies, I think you'd say, this is our, our second consecutive year of meeting, and yet, 
Uh, we've been meeting as an affinity group outside of TCG as a Middle East America initiative convening in New York at the Lark for quite a few years. So um, we're actually in the working group kind of stage of the process rather than the talking about the problems part of the process. And, and a big part of that was working on two documents. So I will share um, uh, two points from the first document, which is a Middle Eastern and Muslim American theater artist bill of rights. Uh, but there are, you know, I'm giving you two, but there are several. Um, we have the right to define our own cultural identities, free of coercion, policing, and stereotypes, and to embrace our myriad identities simultaneously. We have the right not to conform to preconceived notions of our cultural identity and to resist political and social judgments in favor of stories that reflect our own truths. And the second document that might be of interest to a lot of people in this room is a Dear Producers letter. That is a very simple step-by-step -step guide to interact with these stories, artists, and playwrights in a culturally competent manner. Um, as you can imagine, we're dealing with casting, play selection, and all these other issues. Obviously, there's a lot of um, disagreement about some of the issues that are in the letter, so I'm not actually gonna share anything because it's not finalized yet, uh, but please expect this to be shared through TCG and Golden Thread and Silk Road specifically as companies are more than happy to be resources for anyone who's interested in having this conversation further. And, Thank and, you. and please support Middle Eastern American artists. No, Thank seriously. You. <laughs> The Fire Now, Urgent Black Theater Coalitions Today and Tomorrow. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, so I'm Monica Whiting Jr. and uh, this is my first TCG conference. <laughs> so I'm the president of the Black Theater Association, which is a focus group of ASA the Association for Theater and Higher Education. And I wanted to call this meeting um, to organize Black Theater Association with the Black Theater Commons here at TCG, and also there's the Black Theater Network, which is another organization, independent organization, that also um, promotes the elevation of Black theater. So in our meeting, we basically, it was pretty much a session of getting to know one another and what the different organizations do so that we can develop strategies on how to organize. So next steps for us, we will be organizing around different projects to support one another with that. I know there's gonna be a call to action, so some of you will hear from us. There will be a letter that will be um, put forth. There are, what, 16 open positions at different institutions, um, and we will be asking organizations to step up so people are calling for equity, diversity, and inclusion. We want to see it in action. Um, so going forward, we will continue to organize, continue to work together, and at some point, we do look forward to uh, collaborating, collaborating with other focus groups. Thank you. Theaters of Color Breakfast. Yes, uh, so yesterday morning uh, at 8 o'clock, we had a Theater of Colors <laughs> breakfast. Uh, and it was a very colorful convening, as you can imagine, uh, as long as we were able to stay awake. Um, one of the major issues we discussed was uh, finding common ground. And we know that there's a lot of common uh, interest and issues between us. Uh, we also talked about funding and funding equity and what were uh, opportunities out there for doing that and what were the, some of the challenges involved with doing that, uh, particularly with, with a, a stronger sense of uh, strength amongst organization and the need uh, to basically not necessarily DIY it or do it yourself, but to be more independent and not necessarily dependent on other funding. Uh, we talked about intersections and opportunities uh, to work across communities of color and to, to start exploring those op opportunities. I, I run a, a Latino theater company, but, but we should be able to open our doors to uh, other companies coming in and sharing our space or doing collaborations with us. Uh, we also talked about, uh, oops, 
think the light just went out on me. Uh, I think one of the most important conversations we had is that uh, now, almost 15 years after the White Oak Conference, which was uh, organized by TCG to get uh, leaders from uh, organizations of color together in the same room to talk about things that were important to them, it's time that we have another conversation coming along the line. And this morning, we set about setting the table for that kind of discussion as we move forward. Great. Um, we also, uh, to add to that, we talked about um, writers and um, how can we support and facilitate writers of color uh, from academia, from journalism, or people in our communities to reflect, archive, and critique our work from a cultural and authentic voice um, instead of relying on the you know, systemic racist lens that's currently dominating writing methodologies and criticism today. Right? So um, how can we make that happen? And also another really important thing that came out of this breakfast was sharing our successes. You know, sharing it with ourselves and, you know, stand, standing up and saying, yes, we are, we're, we're going to thrive. We're thriving. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Latinx Affinity Lunch regional alliances and how we support Latinx work on the local, regional, and national levels. <laughs> this is what happens when you're not really paying attention. Uh, uh, and suddenly you get elected to be the speaker of this session. Anyway, we had a great session. There were a lot of beautiful people there. Different ages. Young, old, light-skinned, dark-skinned, some who could speak Spanish, some who couldn't. Uh, but that's that's our community, and that's what's beautiful about it. Um, we talked about a variety of issues. We actually broke off into small groups, so each group kind of sort of set the tone for its own areas of interest and own uh, topics of conversation. Uh, one of the things we talked about was the need to create more local and regional uh, alliances of, of, of color or of Latino interest, uh, not to gain, say, uh, the national movement that's going on. But in each area, we have different issues that we're dealing with, different kinds of resources and different kinds of communities. Uh, we also talked a lot about supporting artistry, but, but going beyond just sort of at the upper level, but looking at uh, you know artistry that uh, is involved behind the scenes as well, and the importance of, of sort of filling up the whole spectrum of, of opportunities for Latinos at the bottom and at the top and everything in between. Um, we talked a lot about empowerment and the need to, uh, to basically get our place at the table where decisions are being made and not necessarily be satisfied with someone else making those decisions for us and just taking the leftovers, but that we had a right to be there and we had a right to ask and we had a right to make our place uh, secure. And then finally, we sang Las Mañanitas, which is a happy birthday song to Viviana. Thank you. Where art and motherhood collide. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Kenesha Foster. Uh, ask not what a mama can do for you, but please ask what you can do for a mama. are a mama, you know a mama, and if you, you may even have a mama, you very well may. Okay, so, um, and it's easy to forget how much we do. So we really had a practical conversation about what we need. I'm, talk to, I'm gonna talk to the mamas in the room about things that we, we can do, I'm gonna talk to everybody else about things that you can do. So um, some really practical things that came up is, just so you know, when women in your organization, whether they are outside working for you or inside, get pregnant, one of the first things we feel after joy is fear and shame about having a conversation with you. And that shouldn't happen. No. So, um, and, and it, people don't even know how to approach an organization to tell them they're pregnant. That was the biggest question in the room. Which means we are not creating a space where women can feel proud of that. No. And we're, we are not creating a space where women can feel safe. And that's not okay. So um, if you don't feel safe and you're wondering how to broach that conversation, there were some great things that came up. 
One is make a plan in writing for how you would like your maternity leave to go, how you would like to be compensated, and how you plan to come back into the workspace. Gather other people um, in your organization of all genders to come and be in the room with you to have the conversation to support you. Go to a board member. Often board members do have children, if even if people in the theater do not. So you can go to board members and talk to them about your plan, ask for their support, ask them to read through it, and ask them to walk into the space with you. Um, things that people in the room can do. Um, celebrate when somebody says that they're pregnant. <laughs> Don't say, oh, are you coming back? You're not coming back. You're coming back to them. Don't do that. Do not do that. Um, ask, how do you want to come back? How can we support you? Um, giving them days where they can work at home, even when they're full time, once a week, twice a week. Um, creating ways that parents, even in your organization, can have um, cooperative parenting together. So are they having work days actually together that are play dates in one of their homes, but they're doing work for your theater? Um, for parents, look at the schools around you to get support. So create groups with other parents, especially if you're moving across country for a theater and you're leaving family, you don't have support. One of the biggest things, that if you're hiring a parent to come across the country, one of the biggest thing they're thinking is, where does my child go? Where does my child go? But they cannot say that to you, you know why? Because there are many people, even people in this room, whose offers have been rejected once they ask that question. For either a directing job or for a full-time gig. And that makes us afraid. And you can stop that fear by being the person who says, can I help you with that? We're having conversations about that. What do you need? Do you need to work from home? I trust that you will do that work. I'm not gonna make you feel bad, and I'm never gonna say to you, remember when you took that break when you actually were having a baby? <laughs> or raising a baby? Uh, okay, help him off. many gay men, and we honor their leadership and their willingness to step back and look at so many gay men. We had a 200% increase in lesbian representation. <laughs> Me and two others. We wondered whether by identifying ourselves and moving to that identity, were we othering the other? A question raised by young trans people. We looked around at the generations among us and realized that we went from boomers to X to Y to millennials. And so we told stories of queer organizing and artistic success across generations. And we believe we will win and so we told one another how. One of those ways being that we intend to break out of the time, time, the time constraints of a one hour luncheon and claim time and space to do some organizing which Harold is now going to tell you about. So we have pulled together a design justice team and that's LBGTQQI individuals who are interested in helping us design what kind of queer and trans movement space that we want here at TCG and working with the staff um, and leadership at TCG to make that happen. So if you're, it's a shared leadership thing, it's not just me and Lisa, if you're interested um, in being a part of that design justice team, please see me. Thank you. You know, Lisa Mount told me, nobody stays under two minutes unless you like, you know, have the, the watch here. And she was right at two minutes. Very, very, <laughs> very impressive, um, as most have been. Um, so now we're going to do allyship. 
moving beyond diversity and inclusion towards curating affirming and reflective spaces that transcend gender. All right, hey everybody. I'm trying to do this justice. My colleagues unfortunately had to fly back to New York City because um, Laura's Ashley Hunter, the executive director of the Trans Women of Color Collective, is a very busy woman. Um, so in our session, I'll do some report outs that we had. We, uh, we talked about, you know, just don't talk about, you know, uh, trans identity. We talked about just doing it. Um, we talked about the urgency that it is important to call, lean in and call out and name certain things because um, some folks in society just don't want trans, non-binary, and two-spirit to breathe air. So we actually named people of trans women of color that were murdered. We held a moment of silence for those folks. Um, we watched some videos. We said um, if you're a person and you call yourself an ally, that at your theater or in the park, uh, to your grandmother or your grandfather, your mom and dad and families, you should be interrupting and dismantling uh, anything that has to do with oppressing trans people, non-binary people, or two spirit folks. And if you're not doing that, if you're not doing that kind of work, that low-hanging fruit, then you are complicit and you are an oppressor and opting into a white supremacy culture. We also talked about uh, allyship, diversity, and equity, how these definitions are definitely defined by a white supremacy culture and we will not adhere to those. We talked about creating reflective and affirming spaces that you should work within community versus imposing, imposing stories on trans people and non-binary people and two-spirit people. So we talked about um, doing the work needed to uh, uplift those stories. And um, we talked about things that you can also do. You can make a meal for others. Something simple as that goes a very long way. We talked about not necessarily having people come to your theater or your organization, that you should actually be going out into the community to see theater as best as you can. Even if it's not um, a show that you're working on, it should be throughout the entire year and you should have a strategic plan. So get a plan, people, and the bathroom thing, we've moved beyond that and if you haven't, look that up. You know, the train is passing you by. It's passed you by. Thank you. Barriers to women's leadership in the theater? So this was actually put together by Carrie Perloff, the amazing Carrie Perloff from ACT, and Ariana and I were part of it, as was um, Heidi Stillman from Looking Glass Theater Company, Cynthia Ryder from Oregon Shakespeare, and Hannah Hanna Sharif from Center, Center, Sta Center Theater, right, Center Baltimore. Stage, Baltimore, Baltimore. Baltimore. sorry. I'm losing my mind, right? Those were the six of us? And uh, Erica, wait, Erica. that's me. It's you, sorry. And me. <laughs> <laughs> and Erica, and, and, and yeah. So that, those were the six women. You got everybody, okay. And, um, and Carrie, you, uh, Carrie reported out to everybody in the room first about, we all were together to start, and then we broke off into two groups, but we started with uh, a Lort Theater research uh, 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 thing that was done by Wellesley College, which really um, spoke to the, the non-movement of women in leadership positions, artistic and executive directorship at those, at those big organizations. The finding found, first of all, that the, we have no substantive training um, in our field, there's no there's no training happening to train the future leaders. Um, we work in a field where those positions are chosen by people completely not in our field. Um, there's a lack of trust for women. Men are hired on their potential, and there is no trust that a woman that doesn't have a resume that looks right looks right for the job. Um, and also, of course, the family work-life balance is often put into question, even though it's not legal to really bring up. Um, people make the assumption that a woman would not want to relocate. So we really tried to skew the conversation to how do we, first of all, how do we as women um, look, at a, look at a job um, differently so that we are saying, when we don't have 100% of the skills, we might have 60% of the skills, we're still going to apply. If as a managing director, applicant, we go, I haven't done fundraising, we realize, well, what does fundraising entail? Relationship building, 
communication, listen, all the skills women are actually really good at. Um, in artistic directorships, if you haven't produced, what does that actually mean? Um, and breaking that down to realize, oh, we produce in everyday life all the time. So men seem to apply for jobs if they're like 40% you know, accurate for the job, whereas women, if they've got 90% of the skills, we're not putting ourselves out there. Now, even if we want to put ourselves out there, how do we then change the minds of the board of directors at theaters across the country and the search firms that really own those job searches, all of which are really run by white men? Um, and so we really are shift, trying to shift into how we look at everything in, as capacity and potential as opposed to skills. What is, your, what is the capacity of this person to get the skills as on the job? And I know our time, real quick, I want to, oh, <laughs> I want, we also acknowledge that, you know, this problem that is for women is double, tripled, quadrupled for non-binary people, you know, and people of color, women of color, you know, so we wanted to just acknowledge that in the room. Um, and then additionally, uh, we, it's a fact, it is a fact that men are hired on potential and women are hired on their resume and, that, and what they have done, not what they have the potentiality to do. So how do we start talking and changing those minds to have people see our potential? Because we can do, we do do, and um, we need to start thinking about how we can change that mindset in that language. All right, so I want to make sure we have enough time for everyone. Is there support for when we cross two minutes for me to say two minutes? Yeah, 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 Thank you. Support. Okay. Um, beyond, let's see, Beyond 360, Women in Advancement in Theater Leadership. San Francisco and said, no, fuck that. We're gonna um, figure out how to, what are the tactical things that we can do to address this. So our session uh, was about talking about the Berkeley, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Berkshire, listen to me, uh, Leadership Summit, which will be in October and it's hosted by Wham Theater, and it is designed to do a deep dive looking at how we can address gender parity and leadership positions in theater. And we will be doing that uh, by looking at um, barriers of implicit bias, barriers that are structural, as well as psychological bias. And so we gave a presentation about the planning for this event to our group, and then opened it up to really examine, people in the room, why do you lead? What's the choice? What do you bring to your leadership? What are the barriers that you're currently experiencing um, in your own leadership paths? And it was a really incredible conversation because we had a great group of intergenerational leaders, and we were really talking about some ways in which generationally we might be doing damage to each other, and so that that's something to look at and something to unpack. Um, looking at how we can create mentorship that is really empowering, as well as how can we start addressing those issues of trust and familiarity, affordability, work-life balance, um, that's so necessary in terms of allowing all of us to succeed and allowing all of us to be in leadership positions for those who aspire to. So that was the beginning of our conversation. Gender equity on our stages, creating a toolkit for change. Well, I know we want to hear about that one. Okay. Um, I think that one was the uh, Kilroys sharing some of their strategies, I think. Um, so goal 2020, a clear vision for intersectional gender equity. Hi, I'm Jane Vogel, and I'm founder of Age and Gender Equity in the Arts, and my two access issues are that I hate talking with my back toward anyone, and I get dizzy to walking in circles. <laughs> so I want to give a shout out to my Portland theater community and family. Many of them were here, and they have been amazing partners in um, Age and Gender Equity's um, short tenure. We were only three years old here in Portland, and what we're trying to do is advance opportunities for women in theater. Um, 
The incidence of violence against women every 90 seconds, a woman is raped in this country, every nine seconds a woman is assaulted. The underrepresentation of women is, is really horrible, and all of those statistics are layered and increased when we look at women of color, when we look at trans women, queer women, women with disabilities. And I am very interested, we are very interested in doing something about it, not just talking about it anymore. And so one of the things that we are doing um, through our organization is that uh, we have created some funding, some initiatives with incentives for theater companies that are looking at this. Uh, we're creating community engagement programs for the year 2020. That is the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. That was not just a battle fought by white women, by the way. And one of the things that we would like to do is create some kind of, of an event. And one of the wonderful things I've learned by being here is that there are other organizations who are also interested in doing that. Portland is always up for a good party. We're going to have a good party. We're going to not only have theater be the epicenter of our party, we're going to invite other arts Two organizations minutes. to participate in this and get everybody in Portland and around the country 51% leadership, directors, lead actors, designers, producers. Model or mentor, the mentorship model. Catchy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melinda Funstein Vaughn from Statera Foundation for Intersectional Gender Equity in the Theater. And um, uh, we spent just an hour, which was not enough time, to talk about this subject and something that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I feel like people talk about mentorship or the need for it in the same way they talk about going to LA for pilot season. Like, what is it, a tent that you just show up at and it happens and uh, it's successful, you know? Um, so, in the spirit of building on all of the great sessions in this uh, arc of at the intersections and also uh, the space that's created here for all of us to speak aloud the barriers we face, like that there are not enough marginalized voices in leadership, therefore there are not enough models or mentors available to those who need them. Uh, we have to just spend the hour talking about uh, a couple of specific tools to either make our current mentorship models or uh, relationships stronger or to create uh, mentorship relationships from the get-go that then can turn into great long-term organic relationships. So the first is uh, to make the relationship formal and uh, to articulate the, the, a need statement, first off going in so that you have a means and end statement the way we create our missions for our organizations so that we know specifically what we're in the relationship for. Uh, and then that helps to give us specific questions to ask and a mentor specific questions to answer. Then also to set a, t a specific time frame and formalize the frequency and type of communication. And uh, then third, to make it mutually beneficial. So to make sure that it's not just on the mentor side that we're talking about joy bucks from passing on uh, our experiences, but that uh, we're, we're uh, passing along the pathways that got us to uh, success. Thank you. Uh, the fallacy of good intent, the emotional journey of confronting your white bias. I didn't know I was going to be talking in front of such a huge group of people, and I'm very nervous, so um, please forgive me. Uh, so this was a um, panel put together by my colleague, Dr. Angela Parshiller, and I, um, talking about um, uh, white bias um, through the lens of my particular community, the Atlanta theater community. Um, so some of the things that we talked about was how you move forward through your fear and shame, and we talked about some specific actions. Um, specifically, that naming starts with naming your own actions. Um, I, we talked about how uh, white people uh, think we are more woke than we actually are. 
Um, <laughs> we talked about taking the invisible burden off of people of color within our institutions, and we talked about putting people of color in positions of power in organizations and gave examples of how. Um, I hope it was generative for the people who came to the talk, um, and uh, I felt it was uh, really powerful for me, and I hope that other people who attended um, got something really good out of it. So thank you. Creative Access, Accommodations for Professional Performers with Disabilities. Thank you. I did not lead this section um, or plan it, but our colleagues, they've all left town and I, and I uh, agreed to report out. Um, uh, it was led by a tallery and they had some really good advice for the field. One was do not um, stop working with actors with disabilities because you think you have to make something 100% accessible. Do not allow, um, a, a, it's okay for something to be possible. It doesn't have to be perfect. So aim for that. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, one of your biggest um, uh, roles is going to be talking and allowing them to tell you as a producer what you can do to be uh, more accessible. You're an expert in your own theater, so you know what questions to ask the artist. And the artist is an expert in their own body and they can talk to you to talk about um, accessibility. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and uh, I also will be reporting out for the Ghost Light Project, so give me a moment. Um, so, uh, and please visit Conference 2.0. Uh, there were some really great um, resources that were shared in the disability session. So, um, organizations, you can go to um, to find out where you can find actors with disabilities. Um, there are a lot of really great databases out there, um, as well as tools um, for actors themselves. Um, in the Ghost Light Project, we crowdsourced information from the room around collective action. Uh, and some of the takeaways were connect with um, Connect with the communities that are most affected and, and take their lead. Um, uh, and we raised the question, should you start a project or is there something that is already happening in the world that you can amplify or participate in? Um, be mindful of the human and monetary cost of participation, um, especially when you're collaborating with less resourced organizations. Listen, 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 listen to the field, listen to your theater partners, listen to your community, uh, and, and, and listen to, just listen. That is going to be the <laughs> linchpin of your organization. Um, uh, there is power in many people making a small investment to create a large thing. Um, and you can participate by doing something as simple, simple as liking or commenting on something that games the algorithm and makes sure more eyes see the important message. Um, you can take action by writing something. You can take action by embodying something. You can take collective action by simply doing a training inside of your own organization so that you are helping to share that information. So there's a lot of ways to get involved and we encourage you all to join us with theghostlightproject.com. Confronting White Supremacy in Theater Production. Um, I kind of want to call it action to have more production staff at this, um, at this conference. Um, yeah. Encourage bringing them with, because, you know, it's not being talked about much at all. And, um, can all attest to that. I support that. <laughs> so essentially our conversation uh, talked about a couple of things and um, we certainly wanted to make sure that we were clear that when we talked about white supremacist culture that people understood the daily grind of that and we weren't talking about a white nationalist organization, we were talking about the majority of organizations that we live and breathe in, and how we deemed as normal is actually part of a white supremacist reality. So the question then became is how do you confront those things? And one of the things that we, one of the analogies 
um, that I uh, use is when we understand what we're up against, sort of the formidable nature of structural racism, if you look at it like a weed, you won't be surprised when it continues to resurface. And what you're looking for are people in your company who are weed killers, who will help you continue to kill those weeds. And the potency of your weed killer is largely dependent on your own analysis. So what we need for you to do is to really sort of put a value on deepening your analysis so the potency of your weed killer is more effective. And you're not bringing in people who are bringing in weeds with them, but you're actually <laughs> getting people who are gonna help you kill those weeds. Because as one person, your hands get tired, and what you really need is an army of people killing weeds with some potency. So we charge you to really put a value on analysis building so your weed killer is actually effective. Investing in the future, changing theater training to embrace today's America. Hi, good afternoon. First of all, I just want to say that I am full, and so there's a lot of generosity in this room and a lot of information that was shared. And so thank you to everyone for your time, your talent, and your artistry. Um, our session was essentially about looking at um, the method in which artists are being trained and de-emphasizing or um, decentralizing the, this kind of white method of training people in theater in the first place. So that we're, we're looking at other institutions that are cultivated and created on um, uh, centralizing other worldly narratives in order to train people of color. Uh, I think that's really important. It's also important for institutions um, that do train people and are centralized in a white methodology to say what you are in your mission statement. <laughs> and say, you know, that's what we study, this is what we teach here. So um, there's no mistake about it. That if someone comes to join your organization, they know what they're signing up for. And uh, we tried to, mo in our workshop, we just tried to model, show different ways of disrupting white supremacy and other forms of oppression um, through pedagogy, through curriculum, uh, of course, with faculty, administration, all these different levels of oppression that um, create these systems within these institutions. And we asked at the end for everyone to think of two things. One, Thing that they can person, one action item that they can personally take on to disrupt white supremacy and other forms of oppression in their institutions, whatever those institutions are, um, from their own position of privilege or um, access. So one thing that they can do, and then also one demand they're gonna make of their institution, asking the folks who are higher up than them to make, to disrupt white supremacy in their institutions. And so another, and another thing we wanted to ask all of you, even if you don't work in a, in a higher ed or some kind of educational setting, many of you went through these programs. You are alumni of these programs. Go back and um, make some demands of institutions that you came out of and say, this, these are things that need to be changing in order to serve um, students of color and all underrepresented students. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. We are at two minutes. Email me. <laughs> Uh, centering our voices, perspectives from working actors with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Anyone? Yes. purely coincidence that I'm here. I had no idea this was going on. <laughs> um, so my name is Eliza Jensen. I am a part of FAME Academy. It's a small um, performing arts school for adults with disabilities, um, particularly intellectual and developmental disabilities, which I have an issue with. Um, but we basically talked in our panel today about breaking down those barriers and specifically hiring hiring talented folks 
with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, but really disability disabilities. <laughs> um, and ha just the um, recognizing the oppression and letting that go. And um, we talked a lot about the challenges that we faced in the past and what professional organizations have been doing um, from now forward and um, just had a conversation about where we're going. Um, and uh, so I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> So you know this is always a, a learning thing for us. We're constantly adapting and learning it based on feedback that you give, calling us in in various ways. Um, and so we're gonna do something a slightly different here, which is that a professional affinity group um, has asked to have some space at the mic, and I expect we'll be happy that, that we gave them that space, right? So um, individual artists. <laughs> Participated. I invite you, if you are able to stand, raise your hand, or blink twice. Let's look around at these individual artists. They are really good at things. Talk to them. So, uh, things that we talked about, we talked about a lot of things. It was charged, right? It was charged. So, um, at the end of our session, we came up with a list of genius ideas. I'm going to read some of those. Um, we're talking about um, how to infuse uh, spaces like this with more input from individual artists. And um, the space we were thinking, how do we digest all that we've been soaking in as the CEO of ourselves, right? So one thing that we talked about was um, for organizations to develop um, an individual artist advisory board uh, to be part of their institutions or a fellowship creating virtual circles for ourselves, um, conferences and uh, spaces focused on aesthetic art and focused on the artists, um, conversations when there's, uh, uh, or conversations like with managing directors or whatnot, to bring in conversation with individual artists, more youth at these conferences and opportunities for youth. Um, an idea coming up, coming up of how do we create more um, uh, community engagement with conservative communities um, ah, crosstalk opportunities with individual artists, institutional leaders, and funders. Big panel-y cross-talking opportunities. Um, oh, for member the PCG member theaters to pledge for open advertisement of positions and also to think how open are the positions. Um, oh, and increased subsidies for increased access for individual artists at these spaces. Am I, am I leaving out something that's important? Thank you. So as this work has grown at the conference, it's honestly gotten a little confusing to know what it at the intersections is and isn't. Um, and that's a good thing, right? You know, ultimately all the work is either in service of justice or in service of something else, right? So I just want to acknowledge that in this, this running order or show flow, um, Something may have been left, a session may have been left out that should be able to speak in this space that is about movement building, that's about justice. So, so if I've left something out, A, I apologize, and B, we've got a little time now. What about the other generation? So I didn't think we needed to take up space at this particular meeting. But if there are folks that would like to speak out uh, about that, about what they experienced, what they felt, what they heard, what they said, uh, then I will yield that space now. I, I don't need to talk, is what I'm saying. Mm. Uh, somebody else should be talking. Oh, Come here. I'm just going to say one thing, which was um, I opened to the intergenerational leaders of color meeting um, in Los Angeles, I think it was six years ago, and I remember us sitting in a room and there were like 20, 25 of us or something like that, and that number has grown to what, 200 or something in that, and I have to say that's tremendous. I really, 
I just remember, I, I applaud TCG for really making that space and opening up and really pushing that forward for that to number to expand to what it has now and for people to feel welcome and included and, and ready to, to actually tackle items that really face our community. So thank you. I just want to say we want more time. We want more time together, maybe a whole day, maybe a pre-conference. Yeah. More time. <laughs> If anyone feels like they were there and have something that they want to speak to uh, on these, this, this sort of movement building theme. Uh... Um, so most of you probably know that on Wednesday there was the um, global pre-conference that happened at PICA. And uh, I see Jojo over there and I don't know if Kevin is still in the house. Uh, and Jess Lewis, Jessica Lewis and I want to give a big shout out of, of gratitude to you all for heavy lifting. Um, in the afternoon session, particularly, uh, and it, it connects to um, at the intersections, particularly because um, we were challenged by bringing our nine colleagues from Mexico City, from Teatro Lina de Sombra, and one of those artists had been detained several hours. Um, and he did get in, luckily, but not, you know, not without a lot of um, prayers in that way. So a lot of heavy lifting and energy to get them here. Um, and we focus this year on, um, on uh, immigrant and refugee uh, communities and how uh, we in the field can be uh, the divide, the, can bridge the divide between immigrants and refugee communities and those born in the U.S. And uh, there was a lot of amazing work, and we started the day with a decolonizing session that Annalisa did, and uh, ended up the day, I don't know if KJ is still here, uh, with a session that KJ did about just collective action steps. Uh, so we are gonna be posting some of that information on, um, on 2.0. We just haven't condensed it all yet. Uh, and if there's anybody else who is there that want to add in, then um, I probably did a disservice to not saying something. I just want to add just super quickly for future global pre-conferences and conversations around international work that it doesn't have to be limited to people who feel like they program international work because increasingly the global is the local. So I just want to encourage that for the future. Okay. Um, so I think we're moving into a, a closing then. And um, this entire time that I've been uh, sitting here listening to all of the amazing work that's been happening in the sessions. I've uh, been thinking about uh, something that happened in this space last night, uh, which was a performance of Hands Up. Who saw that performance? Um, and if you saw that performance, you'll remember one of the last monologues ended. Um, these monologues are about uh, state violence against black men, um, by black men, um, very, very powerful pieces. And, and women, thank you, thank you. Um, and black women. And um, the last piece ended with um, an actor asking us to keep our hands up for a very long time as an example of how difficult it is to be the kind of perfect you need to be in a white supremacy society. You can't keep your hands up that long. And my shoulders were shaking from it. Uh, and so much about that play was also about breath and when we're doing this work about equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, and I appreciate that that language getting called in and challenged a little bit, um, it's so important to remember that fundamentally we're talking about who's got a right to breathe. Um, and so I am asking for support here in closing. Um, I'm asking for support in someone or someones coming up and leading us in a shared breath. Um, it can be one, it can be more. Uh, if someone can come up and lead us in a shared breath. I'd like to give the mic away is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it can be more than one person.
think there is word for breath. Pradyam. Pradyam. So already breathing. 